Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Bipartisan Policy Center. My name is Dennis Shea, and I am the Executive Director of the J. Ronald Terwilliger Center for Housing Policy here at BPC. This will be the sixth conversation in our Leaders Speaker Series, which is intended to spotlight individuals who understand the foundational importance of housing and who have made significant contributions to improving housing affordability in our country. We are thrilled to have with us today a very distinguished guest, Elena McCargo, the president of Ginny May. Welcome, Elena. Thank you. Ginny May plays a critical role in the U.S. housing finance system. By providing a full faith and credit guarantee for $2.4 trillion, that's trillion with a T, in securities consisting of mortgages insured by the Federal Housing Administration, the Veterans Administration, uh, USDA's Rural Housing Service, and HUD's Indian Home Loan Guarantee Program, Ginny May helps connect investors from across the globe to the U.S. housing market. This promotes the availability of mortgage credit to the millions of households served by federal housing programs. Our guest today is certainly no stranger to those in the housing field where she has enjoyed a long and distinguished career. Elena McCargo was sworn in as Ginny May's 18th president in December 2021. Previously, she served as senior advisor for housing finance to HUD Secretary Marsha Fudge. Prior to joining the Biden-Harris administration, President McCargo was vice president of the Housing Finance Policy Center at the Urban Institute, where she helped advance the national policy conversation around reducing racial home ownership and wealth gaps and removing barriers to credit and capital. She also has held important roles in the private sector with CoreLogic and J.P. Morgan Chase. From 2002 to 2012, President McCargo worked at Fannie Mae focusing on secondary mortgage market programs and policy. While at Fannie, she played a critical role executing on the Housing and Economic Recovery Act of 2008, including implementation of new programs to promote mortgage servicing reforms, foreclosure prevention, and loss mitigation solutions. So again, thank you for joining us. And before we start our conversation, let me remind our virtual audience that if you have questions for our guest, you can post them to our Twitter X account, at BPC underscore bipartisan. You can do that throughout the event using the hashtag BPC Live. You are also welcome to submit your questions in the YouTube chat. We will save some time at the end to take questions from both our in-person audience and from our virtual audience. So uh, before, let me, let me just begin. I think, uh, Elena, you know, Ginny May is certainly one of the most important uh, financial agencies in, in Washington, but I think it's also one of the least understood so for those in the virtual world and here in the, in the room here at BPC who might not be as familiar uh, with the critical role of uh, Ginny May, uh, could you start off, start off by just briefly going through the organization's mission? Sure. Sure. Well, thank you, first sure. of all, Dennis, for having me. It's great to be at the Bipartisan Policy Center. It's been a long time since I've been here. Um, so I appreciate the invitation and, and the opportunity to talk about Ginny Mae. Uh, it is true, um, very important to the housing finance system, not only in the U.S., but globally, um, given our investor base, and, and very, very um, uh, not well known. Uh, and I learned this when I was going through my uh, confirmation process, especially because I would tell people, oh, President Biden has nominated me to be the, the president of the Government National Mortgage Association. <laughs> Nobody knew what that was, um, except for like you guys in the room and those that are close to housing. But um, so um, it was it was it was really interesting. Um, and I've been really spending my time since I've been here explaining what we do and all the great work and the great public service servants that are working um, and their careers at Jenny May. Um, we are a government-owned corporation. That in and of itself is unique. Uh, we are housed within the Department of Housing and Urban Development. We provide an ex explicit full faith and credit guarantee of the United States government 
um, on our mortgage-backed securities uh, program. Um, we run a, 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 a we, we basically guarantee timely payments to investors. Um, every single month of principal and interest on mortgage securities that are collateralized by the federal government. So the Federal Housing Administration, FHA, VA, USDA, rural housing, um, and as you mentioned, um, PIH or, or the Indian Loan Guarantee Program are all of the government mortgage lending programs that provide um, um, access to credit to um, communities and people uh, really underserved, a lot of low to moderate income, um, special um, specialized populations. And so we do single family and multifamily collateralization. We also um, back the healthcare program at FHA uh, and the loans that are made. So for, for hospitals and um, senior care facilities, also something that is less known. Mm -hmm. um, and we pretty much back 100%, almost 100% of the uh, multifamily affordable housing uh, program out of FHA. Uh, and so there's a lot of um, good things to talk about as it relates to the role we play in making housing affordable and creating liquidity and access uh, through the process. Um, we are also, you know, we have really two critical stakeholders in the secondary market, uh, issuers being one of them, and that's banks and non-bank financial institutions, mortgage banks that are doing mortgage lending, but also investors around the globe who are um, investing in Ginnie Mae mortgage-backed securities, which enables us to, um, you know, put more money back into the system and make more loans and uh, allows lenders to make more loans um, to people uh, and communities that need them. So, um, so really a critical role, and that's 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 the that's the place where we play. Um, and you know, our issuers are a volunteer army, is what we call them, uh, often um, because really uh, doing issuance, it's a very different model than, for example, Fannie and Freddie. Um, and we have a heavy reliance on those issuers. Those issuers are um, primarily majority non-banks today. Um, that was very different than where we were, you know, ten years ago. Uh, where it was primarily banks. Um, and so the dynamics, um, the, the risk profile, everything uh, in our business has really changed fundamentally since the great financial crisis. So I'm looking forward to getting into all of that with you and talking more about it. So, so the, uh, the, the lenders are insured by federal government agencies. Are the lenders, are most of the time the lenders also the issuers of the securities? Yes, so the lenders and so, and are the issuers of securities for Ginnie Mae. Okay. So it's a very, very different model than the than the GSEs. Could you could you just sort of explain that a little bit? Uh, you know how, how people uh, I think are more familiar with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac yeah, as opposed the, to Ginny. What's the what's the main? Yeah, I would say the big one of the biggest differences. Um, Fannie and Freddie, um, they are in, involved in the underwriting, in the creating of the policies underlying um, the loans that are made in the conventional mortgage market. Um, they also issue and have just a different, a completely different business model. Ginny May, and, they, and they're also in a very different loss, credit loss position than Ginny May is. Um, Ginny May is, um, because of our issuer and our model, our issuer based in our model, with our explicit guarantee, we are essentially in a fourth loss position. Um, so that means we stand behind a number of counterparties before um, before before we take any um, losses um, in the government, and um, and we essentially stand. We do not create um, underwriting guidelines. We we securitize loans that are made under the guidelines of the federal agencies that make mortgages, mm -hmm. uh, and so we don't influence that process. We work with those agencies very closely. Um, to make sure that we understand the guidelines and we understand what's in the securities underlying those. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and then we uh, obviously manage the risk of the counterparties, and our counterparties are those issuers. Um, and um, so, it's a, so it's, again, a very different model that, that puts us in a, um, in a better loss position um, than, than you might see, which is why, and I'll, I should have mentioned this at the top, um, on August 1st, Ginny May uh, celebrated its 55th birthday. Mm -hmm. um, and so 55 years of, um, of great work with, without interruption on behalf of the federal government. Uh, now, again, going from a you know, $500 million enterprise to a two point, almost $2.5 trillion um, organization. And um, so the growth has been incredible. And the, um, the story of the 55 years has just been 
it's been pretty transformative to see a federal government agency be able to sort of keep pace with all of the change that has happened, whether it's technologically or, or otherwise in our housing finance system in America. So it has played a really, really crucial role in making sure access to credit and affordable housing has been made available to, again, low to moderate income families, our veterans, our seniors. Mm -hmm. um, so um, so I, just, I, I should have mentioned that at the, at the top. No, it's yeah. great. I mean, you, you mentioned the, uh, the fourth loss position. Uh, you know, I worked on the uh, BPC Housing Commission report and a key part of our report was envisioning a new housing finance system uh, for the U.S. in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis. And we were attracted by the fourth loss yes. position uh, model of, of Ginny May. So, uh, well, so you've been pr uh, president for almost two years, approaching two years. Mm -hmm. Give us your top priorities. And, uh, sure. I mean, so we've been, uh, it's been, it's been an interesting time, uh, as you can all Imagine, as you are all experiencing yourselves um, in the housing market these last two years, um, coming out of the pandemic, um, we started there. Uh, we did a lot of work um, focused on how we in the secondary market could support um, the programs that the agencies were putting in place around loss mitigation. Um, so we did some things, some creative things in the secondary market. We created some, for example, a 40-year security uh, securitization program called the Extended Term Program. We did a repooling program. Um, those those enabled billions of dollars of um, of modified loans to be able to be resecuritized and put back out into the marketplace. Um, and so that we've done a lot of development. That's where we started, really, because when we got here, um, you know, the pandemic was still very much a uh, real uh, driver of what was happening, and we were and we were seeing in the government sector um, the largest number of. Um, defaulted mortgages underlying. And so there was a lot of support and liquidity that our issuers needed um, through that space through that period. So we did um, focus there. We have been um, really, um, you know, it, our risk management program has been it's kind of the number one thing um, that we think about every single day is sort of who our issuers are. Are they financially in good health? Um, as I mentioned at the top, we have um, really seen a transformation of the underlying issuer base yeah. that supports us. So the independent mortgage bankers um, and you know non-bank banking sector mm -hmm. has really stepped up since the crisis and has done the majority of um, government lending um, and disproportionately serving um, the, those that we are here to serve. So that has been um, in our minds. That is a that is a huge shift from pre-2008 um, and post-pandemic is just really, we have a whole new landscape that we are supporting, that is supporting um, this part of the housing market. And uh, we, we just are doing everything we can to stay on top of, um, collect data, understand what's happening, um, watching you know, all the various factors that we watch every single day, prepayments, defaults, um, because of the sector that we operate in. And so that's been um, a top priority for us, including the recent um, announcements about eligibility requirement changes that we did in conjunction with FHFA mm -hmm. um, and Director Thompson. We partnered to make sure we could be consistent and aligned in that um, because that is so important of, as an underpinning of the housing finance system. So um, so those are some of the things. There's um, We've got some work um, going on to really try to expand access to the platform. Um, this is a, not a way we'd really talked about or thought about Ginny Mae, but Ginny Mae has, a, has the power to really create and enable scale. Um, and there are a lot of small financial institutions, um, CDFIs, credit unions, um, even the housing finance agencies at the state level that do not have access to us because our eligibility requirements um, require huge volumes to be able to participate and be an issuer. Um, so we are doing some work with the federal um, home loan banks um, and some others to figure out ways to have maybe aggregate to get community-based lenders, CDFIs, and others through our task force access to the platform. Um, as you know, Dennis, and I think everybody here knows, one of the first things President Biden did when he came into office was he put out an executive order about equity. Um, and it focused a lot on equity and housing. Mm -hmm. um, and so it ch challenged every single agency. Secretary Fudge looked across all of, the, all of HUD and all of the agency heads looked across their businesses. We were charged to look at how Ginnie Mae can be a a bigger player in making access to financing more equitable. Um, and we think that there's a really important role that Ginny May could play there. So in order to do that, not only do we need to be 
um, helping and serving who we serve today through the se- through the system, but we need to make our platform more accessible to to smaller players and others who are doing that lending in the community um, that we care so deeply about. So, um, so that's been a huge focus um, for us as well. Well, let me. You, you mentioned the non banks being sort of becoming a much, much larger segment of the lenders in the FHA program, which yep. you, you backstop. I mean, what, what particular, uh, non-banks, as I understand it, don't have access to the Fed's uh, discount, the Fed window uh, when there's a problem. They don't have a customer base, a deposit base uh, to tap into if there's a financial problem. What, what are the unique concerns that... Uh, yeah, I mean, so what you're talking about is is uh, is real. It's a dynamic at the beginning of the pandemic um, that everybody was really fearful about, which was what's the liquidity that's going to help support how how will we? There was a real concern that like things would stop at the beginning, and you guys you guys know this. You remember this at yeah. the beginning of March of 2020. Everybody was like, "Oh, wait a minute, we're going to have a serious issue here," um, and um, we were saved. Thankfully, um, I, I will say the, the non-bank issuers and others were really um, able to maintain and even grow because of the refinancing and the low sort of monetary, you know, we were in a very low interest rate environment. There was a ton of refinance business still happening, and that really kept folks going and afloat, so they didn't need the facilities. But at the time, Ginny Mae did put um, their pass-through assistance program in place, PTAP, which is a liquidity um, support, but it's not, um, it's not perfect. Uh, it doesn't help in all in all ways. Um, it was it it had a lot of limitations, mm-hmm. um, and there were a lot of people at the time that were asking for um, the government to figure out ways for the non banks to tap into some of the other liquidity facilities that are available to the banking sector, um, and didn't really that didn't get where it needed to get. Um, I'll just say this. Um, Non-bank liquidity um, is is sort of the biggest challenge um, of our time, especially now, because we are not in a 2%, 3% interest rate environment. Um, the cost for them to borrow, the, for, the, for the non-banking system to borrow, the, acts, the cost of credit, um, the lack of, um, you know, just being in a purchase market with no refinances is a huge, huge stress um, on the system. And so... Um, we're, we're thinking about and focused on this every single day, working with our partners at Treasury and elsewhere um, to, to figure out how we could support, um, you know, w- what ways the government could support in the future um, a more robust um, facility for the non-banking sector. Um, haven't figured it all out yet, but definitely um, a, a huge, mm-hmm. huge, um, I believe, I will just say, speaking for myself, um, uh, probably one of the biggest needs that we need to figure out. We do not need to enter another crisis downturn of any kind and not have a, uh, not know how we're going to support um, these institutions. These institutions are incredibly important to the system and to the the constituents that we all serve. Um, and so, you know, their failure is is a, is a is a major major would be a major problem for all of us. So I think we just have to figure out what that's going to look like, and that's been some of the work we've been very focused on um, with our colleagues. Great. Thank you for that. Um, you, you alluded uh, to President Biden's executive order on equity. Mm-hmm. Um, I know the National Housing Conference has, a, uh, with numerous organizations, trying to increase the number of black homeowners, I think, by 3 million by 2030. Um, what world do you see Ginny May? playing in closing this, this racial home ownership gap. And it's important because uh, we build wealth in this country primarily through home ownership. Mm-hmm. So uh, closing the racial home ownership gap is, is important. So w- how does Ginny May, could you elaborate more on how Ginny May is playing into that? Yeah, I mean, so this work on closing racial home ownership gaps has been like kind of my career's work. I've been doing this work for a long time. Um, and um, I feel and I thank uh, President Biden for just being thoughtful. And again, it was a day one thing, and that's not typical, that you think about um, furthering and advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities um, throughout the federal government. And I feel like that um, just really empowered all of us to think deeply about how we could, how the mechanisms, the agencies that we support and that we 
um, are um, accountable for can be a part of that. And, and, and it made us think outside the box quite a bit. And in the conversations we would have with our partners, with lending institutions, banks, non-banks and the like, um, it, it, it's always, it's sort of there now as a thing for us to continue to think about. And I think that's really important. It, it should always be because we do not have, um, it's just the, the playing field has not been leveled and we still have a lot of work to do to try to, to, try to close the major gaps that, that still persist um, in our country. I think there's, you know, the, the racial homeownership gap has grown. Um, uh, the pandemic was, um, uh, there was a boost. There was a lot of um, homeownership um, created throughout the pandemic, which um, I think is a great thing. Uh, you know, and, and now we're in a position or in a situation where home prices are very, very high. Mm -hmm. Interest rates are very, very high. Um, and the ability to afford anything in terms of monthly payment um, is very, very hard, mm -hmm. um, especially for first-time home buyers, which is a, you know, Ginnie Mae supports the majority of first-time home buyers um, through the various federal um, housing programs. So it's, it's, um, it is important to me that we continue, and I, as I mentioned, um, the work we're doing to try to expand access uh, to the Ginnie Mae platform. I, I am a believer, and I say this, many of you in this room have heard me say it before, that um, in order to really expand home ownership opportunities for um, black and brown communities and the like, we, and low to moderate income communities, we have got to, um, we've got to have, we have to be talking about government lending because that is where many first time home buyers um, getting their first opportunity um, in home ownership, that's where they're getting their loans. Um, so expanding, having more, having more participants um, doing FHA lending, doing um, VA lending, doing USDA rural lending, creating that scale, that's where we can really make a difference. So we have been focused on where we can play to, to create scale in the system um, to really to help to close these gaps. And so that's been, that's been sort of priority and definitely um, in focus for us um, at Ginnie Mae every single day. Now, thank you for that. Now, I know Ginny Mace, mm -hmm. you know, you think of it as a demand side organization. It's on the demand side of the housing market, promoting liquidity and, and access. But so I was surprised when I was reading the uh, federal, uh, President Biden's housing supply action plan, <clears throat> a reference to Ginny May where it includes a proposal to make the uh, recently relaunched federal financing banks risk sharing program uh, which provides uh, low interest loans to state and local housing finance agencies permanent and creating a financing mechanism for it through Ginny May. And so how, could you explain all that and, and how, how would it work and what's Ginny sure. May's role? Yeah, in simple terms, so the so there's a currently there's a multifamily risk sharing program that really provides gap financing for multifamily developments all over the country. Um, and it's run through the state housing finance agencies um, in connection with the with FHA, the Federal Housing Administration, on the multifamily side. Um, it's uh, it's a terrific program, and it's supported by Treasury and the Federal Financing Bank, which is where, tre where it currently that's in Treasury. That, yes. Yeah. So it was stood up. I forgot what year, but I think 2014 or something like that. Um, it was a temporary program. Um, to really help spur more development and support of financing um, in communities and states. And um, it was shut down in the last administration, it, so it was allowed to expire. Okay. Um, and that was a tremendous amount of financing to communities and states that um, was out of the picture for a little while. As soon as the Biden administration came in, one of our first priorities was to get it back up and running. So FHA and um, the Federal Financing Bank at Treasury uh, worked together and reinstituted the program. It is currently um, in place again, but it's temporary. So we have been pushing at Ginnie Mae um, and got into the president's budget for 24, <clears throat> creating a permanent program. Um, we believe that this is a really important source of financing and that we can play a critical role in that. So together, FHA and Ginnie Mae could work to create a program and a market um, for these risk-sharing loans. Um, the risk-sharing happens between the, the State Housing Finance Agency and FHA. And, um, and again, is supported by the financing bank in, inside of Treasury. Um, and we think there's a model that could be created, and that's what we're pushing to get the funding to do, get the authorization to do uh, from Congress so that we can play a critical role in a permanent program in the future. It doesn't mean that the FFB program goes away, 
but it does mean that we can scale because FFB is only limited to, I think they've got 19 states maybe, mm -hmm. um, a few more than that maybe now. But, um, but again, it's hard as a state, if you think about it, to make a commitment to a program like that and all you have to invest in operationalizing it when it's temporary <laughs> and it may go away again as the administrations change or whatever. Um, and so I think that's unfair to ask states to do that. And I think if we had a permanent solution that all states could participate in, build their systems and infrastructure to support, um, that that would be a kind of a win-win. And it's a great, great way to um, spur and support these great affordable housing developments that are happening on the multifamily side that we obviously mm -hmm. need to see in our supply um, picture. So You definitely need more affordable we, multifamily. Absolutely. Also known as <clears throat> rental housing, uh, more yes. affordable rental yes. homes. Um, you know, when we, when the BPC 10 years ago sort of proposed uh, maybe this new housing finance system would be based on the Ginnie Mae model, we got some pushback from people. And actually using the Ginnie Mae platform, mm -hmm. using Ginnie Mae and, and expanded Ginnie Mae, uh, people said, uh, Ginnie Mae has got outdated technology, outdated processes, um, they, they have workforce issues, but... Um, I know you're making increased investment in technology and modernization, including a full migration to the cloud. Don't ask me what that means, but uh, I understand that's what you're, that's what you're yeah. doing. So Don't ask me. Uh, <laughs> no, but I will. I'll, <clears throat> yes. So I can, tell us about yeah. that. Yeah. So um, I would say as um, federal agencies go, I think Ginny Mae is at the top of the house in terms of the platform that has been built to support the securitization engine, the partners that we have in that work um, that is crucial. We run you know, a lot of billions of dollars every single month <clears throat> in payments to investors um, without fail. And um, so we have been, and we've done that successfully forever. We've never missed a payment. We've never missed a beat. Um, so the technology has been um, there to really support this. And again, you know, we are, um, I think, do, leading edge. And we certainly are in our migration to the cloud. Um, that was a huge, huge milestone for the agency. It, it enables us to be a lot more nimble. We were working with, and I'm, I know everybody's familiar with this, old, some old and antiquated systems and on main, you know, and, and so this move to, and transition of our applications and, and enables us to work more efficiently with our issuers. Um, it just speeds up time. It helps us with visibility. And I will say one of the most important things that we've done um, is really improve the data um, that we have that is helping to um, enable our business. So um, we've done a lot of work, not only the move to the cloud, which I think is just an enabling baseline, um, but we have worked um, to secure now all of the underlying data. Um, and I, I will say, was shocked to learn, especially me, I'm a data person and I come from a data background and um, was shocked to learn that Ginny Mae didn't have access to all of the federal agencies' underlying data hmm. um, on, at the loan level. Um, Interesting. Hmm. <laughs> so I was like, well, wouldn't it be great? And think so about all the things FHA we can do. FHA loans and don't know. Don't have all the underlying data at our fingertips for all the loans, FHA, VA, USD, all that. So we have now, uh, we have MOUs and agreements in place with all the federal insuring agencies that send us loans that we package. Uh, and, um, and we now have that data and the access. And that enables a lot of analytics and um, tools and so many things that we can do. It is a big part of our um, ESG program. It enables us to give investors transparency in what is in the bonds. Um, and that has been really, really important. And I don't know if we're going to talk about ESG if there's oh. time, but but I do want to explain why that's so important and what we're trying to do in that space. But um, but this data enablement and this cloud foundation is really advancing our ability to support our issuer base um, and be very transparent with our investors on what's happening. And so that's why the technology journey has been so crucial for us. Well, let's talk about ESG. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, environmental, social, and governance factors. It's a little bit of a hot button issue mm -hmm. here in Washington and elsewhere. I don't so, think it should be. But, uh, but, but tell me what, what, uh, what you're doing, what Ginny sure. is doing in this area. Yeah, um, and I, you know, this is, this is work that it's, it's interesting. We are, um, you know, as I travel the world and talk to investors, 
they are demanding more information and they have mandates from their governments or from their, you know, boards or whatever it may be um, to do more work that is socially conscious, sustainable, um, supporting climate and, and all the different environmental um, factors. And so they're looking at us saying, we do big investing in you. Can you tell us what is in this in these in these securities? And so um, our ability to do that was it was required that we had this data access and that we could make disclosures um, with confidence about what was in our underlying um, loan set. And so that um, that's been a game changer. And so um, it means that we're on the map. Ginny May, from its start 55 years ago, has been a social enterprise. We are probably one of the biggest, most successful social impact enterprises, but we never talked about ourselves that way. Um, because if you think about who, who, is, um, who we're serving mm -hmm. um, by, through this platform, um, when you start to look at that and break it down, um, it's pretty incredible and you can tell a really great story. Um, and we also were thinking about this in terms of CRA. And we, when CRA was being going through its you know, renovation, um, over the last, we we had gave inputs to all the regulators to say we've got this data now. You know, investing in a Ginny May is, you know, maybe folks should get credit for that. And we're hopeful that when a CRA rule comes out, um, there's a really big connection between ESG and CRA, and I think a really a lot of good that could be done in the in the secondary markets participa participation um, around both of those initiatives. Um, we, on our E side, we um, are doing green environmental. bonds. Environmental. Um, we are doing green bonds. We have, um, they are now labeled in Bloomberg and officially so, blue, so um, investors can see that uh, when a security is made up of a lot of loans that have like underlying energy efficiency and a lot of different factors. So all that data is there. We want a climate bond award for the most asset-backed issuance mm -hmm. um, in green uh, last year. We were very proud of that. Um, and we've been sort of behind on this. Like you, the, the GSEs have been further ahead and been talking about this for a long time. We're, we're really catching up. And now that we have the data, we can, get, we can catch up pretty fast. Um, the social bond aspect, we are a social bond. That is, like I said, it is inherently in us. And so now it's just a matter of disclosing low to moderate income variables, first-time home buyer, down payment assistance, senior citizens, basically identifying the communities and um, individuals that we are serving underneath that underlie mm -hmm. uh, you know, our bond and being able to tell investors that, that's, they are hungry for that. So we're in the process mm -hmm. of trying to figure out how to label our bond as a social impact bond um, and give that data on a monthly basis to investors so they know exactly what they're investing in mm -hmm. so that they can then turn around and say, hey, we're doing this investment and we are doing more of this um, so that we can meet, you know, X, Y, Z mandate that their government or that their board um, may require of them. So I just think it feels like a win-win um, ESG does for us. Mm -hmm. And we're not doing anything different. It's not a program. Just basically disclosing it's, more information. We're just about telling what people what they have. Um, and, and naturally what you have, if it's Ginny Mae, is naturally social. So there's no, it's not, again, it's not a new construct, not a new program. It is truly just supporting investors to do more to put money into our, the U.S. housing finance system so we can lend to more people. Like there's no, there's, you know, you mentioned hot button. Like to me, it's a hot button and like I'm excited about it. <laughs> there's no, um, it's not a hot button and like we've not, we're not doing anything differently. We're just, we're just talking about it differently. And I think um, that transparency matters mm -hmm. uh, and it also helps to bring more. And it's, it's why we're just seeing so much growth and so much demand in our, uh, for our securities, so. Thank you, any, any we can take questions now from the audience. If anybody has a question here in person, just please raise your hand and I think we have a microphone that can be brought to you. Anybody have a question here? Don't be bashful. Yes, sir. I'm actually uh, really interested to hear how did Could you say, state your name oh. and where you're from, please? Yes, uh, Hugo Dante. I'm with uh, Washington Analysis. Uh, thank you for speaking to us today. I'm really interested to hear how do you anticipate uh, Ginny interacting with uh, future uh, CRA rulemaking, your ESG program? Yeah, it's, um, you know, we put our thoughts into the regulators' heads around how Ginny may. Um, Ginny Mays, or how banks could get 
credit for investing in Ginnie Mae's. So I believe um, a lot of banks do have ESG reports that are coming out and, and programs that they're trying to. So I, I think there is an opportunity within CRA to figure out a way to give banks credit for that. And we're hopeful. Again, we'll see the rulemaking. Nobody has seen it yet. It's supposed to come out, you know, any day now. Um, we're hopeful that credit for Ginny, for um, investment on the investment side for Ginny Mays will be um, part of that because we think that that's a great, great driver of more production. Um, CRA credit and ESG credit could could be a really, really positive thing, um, and also keep banks um, involved, which banks have been involved. I mentioned. We've transitioned from like a 90-10 bank, non-bank, um, to now, you know, completely flipped where non-banks are dominant. Um, non-banks aren't subject to CRA, but if we keep the, the incentives there um, as, as a good part of the, on the investment side uh, of banks, you know, participating in that CRA program, I just, it feels like a win-win and a great way to continue to keep the banks involved and engaged um, in a meaningful way in making housing finance um, flow in this country. So, um, so that's, it's just, it's another, it's another idea. Uh, many ideas were put on the table during the CRA rulemaking, and we're just anxious to see if, you know, where, where everything lands with that once they come out with the final rules. Any, anybody else have a question here? Any questions from the virtual audience? Yes, Sophia? Are there any updates on Ginny Mae's efforts to reform the Title I program for personal property loans for manufactured homes? Good yes, question. It's a good question. Somebody, probably a Ginny Mae person or FHA <laughs> person planted that one. So, um, so there are updates. Um, last year, or maybe it was earlier this year, I'm losing track of the years, but um, FHA and Ginny Mae worked together and FHA put out an RFI um, that has been collecting and gathering input on the title on the manufactured housing Title I um, program for personal property loans. Um, we are working side by side with them and plan to um, make some. We got we got a lot of feedback from that RFI that was Ginny May specific things about our program that made it very difficult to securitize these loans um, to participate in issuing these. Um, and um, and we have taken that to heart and have been working on. Um, making pretty pretty substantial upgrades and updates to how the manufactured housing Title I program, um, that's the chattel loans, personal loans, um, how those will be, um, uh, how those will work in the future and, and open up opportunities for more um, issuance of that type of collateral. Um, and that's, again, um, when you talk about just affordable, a, affordable uh, collateral type that really needs a boost and would benefit greatly from the ability to do more and scale. Um, this is another place that's a sweet spot for us. So we're doing everything we can to try to um, work with um, FHA and really make the program more attractive. Um, as I mentioned earlier, most of the lending FHA does, 90, I think it's 90, almost 99% of it ends up in a Ginnie Mae security. So um, that tells us that when new programs are put out, if we can make sure we can securitize them and put them back into the market, uh, that's, a, that's a good outcome and more of it will be done. So, um, so this is another place where we'll, we'll, you'll see some policy action from FHA and Ginny May uh, in the future, in the near future, probably before year end. Great. Uh, any more questions from the virtual audience? Uh, we have another question, which is, okay, how can Ginny May support community land trusts. Mm. Communities are adopting shared equity approaches to provide a step on the first rung of the housing ladder, but mortgage financing can be unavailable. unavailable. Yeah. Yeah. Another I, good question. I, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, we haven't worked directly with community land trusts, but I think, and I know there are a lot of shared equity models that have been tested. Um, there's also a little bit, I don't want to say controversy, but I know there are um, a lot of people thinking about, you know, these shared equity approaches as if the equity sharing is with the borrower, you know, and you're trying to advance black home ownership, for example, why do the black homeowners have to share equity? Um, that's like, that's something I've directly gotten feedback on when I was at the Urban Institute. We've, like, people are trying to understand how these approaches benefit the borrower and how can that, and can we be equitable about how that works? I think, um, I, and I 100% agree, 
sh communities that are adopting shared equity approaches are seeing some good progress in that. We almost need them, especially in these really unaffordable places where it's almost impossible to buy. Um, shared equity approaches can really make sense. I don't know if they make sense everywhere, but I definitely think in high cost markets, they make a lot of sense. Um, and I would also say getting on that first rung of the housing ladder, the role Ginny May can play in that is having banks and other financial institutions and non-banks support FHA lending and, 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 and that kind of lending. Oh, so those loans are for first-time home buyers. Ab absolutely, first-time home buyers, absolutely. So that, but that mortgage financing could, would be available it, as long as we have participants in those communities that are working with the community land trusts making those loans. And this is where, again, I think this work we're doing to expand through the CDFI task force, to expand housing finance agency um, um, access to and doing uh, to, to, to the Ginny Mae platform, doing more government lending. Um, I, I, think, I feel like all of that could work together to really enable um, this community land trust approach to, to work better. And there could be special programs, special purpose credit programs. If Ginny Mae can support those, th that would be ways in which we could get those types of, um, those types of um, initiatives off the ground mm -hmm. and scaled. Great. Any more That's questions? Question. Yeah, Seth Appleton. Someone who knows what he's talking yes. about. Yes. <laughs> I know, right? It's, it's good to see a former leader of PDNR and the current leader of Jimmy May on, <laughs> on the stage. I feel right at home. Um, one, you know, one thing you mentioned was kind of the differences between Ginny and um, the GSE market. And last fall, I believe it was, FHFA announced that they were undertaking kind of a pretty um, large transition in credit scoring, including kind of, you know, tri-merge to bi-merge, new models, and the use of alternative credit scores as well. Um, so far, that's been kind of confined to the, to the conventional market, but, you know, whenever these things come up, there's always naturally the question of kind of what are the government agencies going to do, because obviously bifurcation between kind of the government programs and the GSE-backed conventional market yep. kind of always raises kind of interest and, and concerns from, yeah. the, from the industry and market participants as well. And so my question, I guess, is, is has there been thoughts of kind of migrating the kind of credit scoring, you know, current requirements on the government lending side? How does Ginny think about that? What kind of, what do investors think about that? Um, you would love your thoughts on that. Sure. Yeah, we've been um, really uh, in, in a lot of dialogue with the um, insuring agencies um, and with Director Thompson at FHFA about what they're doing on the conventional side. To your point, Seth, and it's a great one and it's an important one, most people enter the government lending space through a Fannie or Freddie platform. Do you, do, desktop underwriting, you know, most lenders put their information in on a borrower and uh, it goes through engines and tells you what the products are that would come out on the end of that. And if there are differences, like the GSEs are usually the first place people look, and then if it goes flows through down to the government lending, if you can't if you can't easily flow down uh, to the government lending programs because you have a different construct than what the government's accepting, that's a problem. Um, that's a that's a barrier to access potentially. That means you're flowing down. If you have, um, for example, buy only two credit scores and a different system or whatever. The government and the government's not accepting that, then you've got an issue. So we've just spent a lot of time talking about how we can get to the place that makes sense, which is that we have one way in which we look at things, um, and we and that's that's a lot of work really on FHA, um, VA, USDA to um, to determine how they want to how they're going to or how what modifications they would ask the conventional market to make so that we can have one system that flows. Um, because as you know, the government agencies don't have underwriting engines. And so that's a big, it's a big, it's a big deal. So that's the lens in which I'm looking at it from is just making sure that we got these insuring agencies at the table and that they are um, thinking about the implications and if they're going to make changes that we, that we have as much alignment as possible because it is really important, especially um, in this space. So it's a great question and I'm glad you, you raised that one. Really, really important issues. There's other issues too, like that. I mean, they're you know beyond credit scoring, but that's been a big um, that's been a big one. And I and I feel like, um, and I know because I've talked to um, Sandra about this, 
we're, we're they're going to take their time. We're going to work together and work through this. Um, we've been collaborating really well, I, I feel like, um, with FHFA, and I think that's just so, it's important to me, it's important to Director Thompson, and it's important to Secretary Fudge that we do that. Um, and Commissioner Gordon at FHA and others um, have been um, ready and willing to be at the table to talk through how we can have good alignment so that we don't disrupt or create barriers um, to accessing the government lending programs in the future. Thank you for that question and thank you for that answer. I'm going to offer the last uh, question. Uh, Elena, you've had really a remarkable career in the private sector, uh, in uh, the think tank world, nonprofit think tank world, in government service, now leading a, a major financial institution. But it seems like the common thread is mission, mm -hmm. uh, public service. So, uh, what pearls of wisdom would you convey to those who are looking, those young people out there who are looking uh, for a career in public service the way you have? Yeah. Well, you know, I encourage young people to get interested in the mortgage market because I think um, we need a great, talented young people to, to do um, this work. It is a, it is a massive um, uh, industry. And there's a lot of different opportunities at different points in the process, and we have a lot of needs. Um, whether it's new appraisal appraisers, new um, you know folks getting into mortgage lending, folks getting into the federal government um, to support. Ginny May is hiring. We do uh, constantly look for new talent. We um, have been very successful. I should mention this is it's kind of one of those underpinning things that happens in the background that we don't talk about as much. But we've been working really hard to expand the budget and resources and staff. Um, at Jenny May, we have been woefully under-resourced. We have not grown very much. If you look at our FTEs, if FTE <laughs> count to the size of the portfolio that is now under our control, not to mention, um, you know, a, along the way, sometimes institutions fail and our guarantee goes into effect. And what that means is we have a portfolio too. So we have a balance sheet and assets that we're managing, whether it's reverse mortgages, which we have a big one of those right now, um, or um, even forward mortgages from prior um, defaults. If there are defaults out there of our issuers, um, that's when we step in and we have to take on that operation. We have to make the pay, you know, we become the issuer, servicer of record. And so there's a lot of capacity we need to build so that we can do that very well because it, our doing that well matters to taxpayers. Um, and and um, so that's, that's a big efficiency and a big area that we've been focused on. And um, we've gotten a ton of support from Secretary Fudge and President Biden. And we have made some strides on increasing our budget. We have a lot more to do there. But all that to say, we are hiring too and <laughs> looking for talented so sign young people. Up for May. So do. It's a great, great, great place. And I should say this this is a good way to end. Um, the public servants that are the 200 plus people that are working there who, who work very closely with a lot of contractor support that we have from all over the industry, um, ha just top notch. I mean, we have such a phenomenal team of career public servants. Um, again, a little overworked at the moment, but, um, but are always there, just so dedicated, looking for solutions, looking to find ways to drive forward, looking for ways to innovate. Um, even with our limited, again, with our limited capacity at times. So, um, so I just, I just want to say a shout out to my team. Uh, the the team at Ginny May is um, is incredible. I know, um, I know everybody that's worked with them would agree, uh, and many of them have been there for a long, long time, um, and have been uh, just would, we would not be where we are without them. So, shout out noted. Shout so. out to <laughs> career staff. Yes. Unfortunately, uh, we're out of time, but uh, President McCargo, I want to thank you uh, very, very much for, for joining us here at thank BPC you so much and the Terwilliger Center. And to, I think this was a very insightful and inform information-rich uh, conversation, so really thank appreciate you. that. I also want to thank everyone who uh, joined us today, both here in person at BPC, but also in the virtual world. Uh, that's it for today. Have a great rest of the day, everyone.